Good morning, everyone. Welcome colleagues and distinguished panelists. It is wonderful to be joined today by so many partners from around the world. My name is Savita Pandey, and I'm the Executive Director of the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. Um, on behalf of the Global Center and on behalf of the Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today for this launch event um, on a framework for action for R2P. Um, please be sure to follow us uh, along with the conversation on Twitter using uh, GCR2P or um, at APR2P uh, to sort of you know, continue the conversation on another platform. We are very excited to be launching this framework today. This document was a significant undertaking uh, taking by, uh, by our two centers, building upon the lessons learned and best practices in the prevention of mass atrocities since the inception of R2P in 2005. We hope that it will be a useful tool for member states as they consider steps towards implementation of the responsibility to protect. Um, we are honored today to have with us several uh, UN special advisors on RTP who will also provide us with their unique perspective of where they think uh, RTP has, you know, how RTP implementation has uh, worked through the years and, and where do we need to go and what progress needs to happen both on behalf of states as well as the, the UN Secretariat. But before handing the floor to my colleagues who will formally uh, talk to you a little bit more about the, the framework itself, uh, Rebecca Barber from the Asia Pacific Center and our very own Jacqueline Straper Hall from the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. I would very like, warmly like to uh, welcome the Deputy Permanent Representative of uh, Australia, Her Excellency uh, Fiona Webster. Uh, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Savita, um, and excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a real honour to participate in this launch of the new framework for action for R2P, which was developed by our long-term partners, the Global Centre for R2P and the Asia Pacific Centre for R2P. Um, I'd like to thank the Global Centre for organising today's webinar, and Savita, thank you so much for your words of welcome. Today's launch can generate vital momentum to advance the implementation of R2P. This year's annual debate on R2P in the General Assembly showed us that many states are looking for ways to move beyond a conceptual discussion of R2P. There is a growing political will for more, than concrete, for more concrete discussion about what states can actually do domestically, and in their foreign policy to better protect people from heinous crimes. Action is all the more needed as conflict related deaths increase around the world, with 2022 being the deadliest year since the Rwandan genocide. Atrocity crimes do not happen without warning. They start out as discrimination, ostracization, hate speech, identity-based violence and the destruction of cultural heritage. We know what the risk factors are and we need to get better at identifying them when they arise and responding to them. Australia is committed to upholding the rules-based international order in which sovereignty carries responsibility and the rights of all people are protected. We agree with Glo the Global Centre and Asia Pacific Centre for R2P that our collective efforts to protect populations have been slowed by a lack of clear guidance on how states can and should implement R2P. In the recent UN debate on R2P, we encouraged the Special Gen Advisor on Genocide Protection Prevention and the Special Advisor on R2P to conduct and share early warning analysis and atrocity risk assessments of developing crises on the ground. The UN framework of analysis for atrocity crimes serves as a valuable tool to identify risk factors for atrocities within countries. It does not, however, set out what states can pra practically do to address these risks. Communicating risk factors to an internal audience or to another state is challenging if not accompanied by clear prevention and response options. As a next step, the new R2P framework for action guides states in what they can actually do 
to build resiliencies to prevent atrocities. One of the great merits of the framework is that it is written for all states. The world is not divided into states that do face a risk of atrocity crimes and states that do not. The framework recognises that all states can take steps to ensure that diversity is valued and people are not subjected to violence just because of their identity. And it recognises that all states, whatever their resources, have a role to play in supporting other states to build fair, equitable, just and tolerant societies. We recognise that in the General Assembly, some states continue to question the principle of R2P. We hope that this framework will promote understanding of what R2P is really about at its core and help to correct some of the misconceptions about R2P. R2P is not a threat to sovereignty. R2P is in essence about the responsible exercise of sovereignty and about strengthening state governance and institutions. The framework clearly sets out the role of governments in addressing risk factors of atrocity crimes and supporting each other to do that. As you listen to the speakers during this launch, I invite you to reflect on how the framework can be embedded in your own systems. We hope that states will circulate the framework internally take actions to better prioritise atrocity prevention at home and in meetings with other states and integrate the framework into atrocity prevention training, policies, plans and strategies. I wish you every success for a rich discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for those really warm words and for a, a very in-depth uh, uh, articulation of what this framework can, can do. And thank you uh, to your government for, for supporting this initiative from its inception. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Rebecca Barber, the Senior Fellow from Asia Pacific uh, Center. Rebecca and Jackie have led the research and the writing of this framework. Um, so without further delay, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Savita, and thank you, Ambassador, again, for those, those warm words. Um, and thank you also to everyone else who's joining us um, this evening or this morning. This proce project has been more than a year in progress now, and it's really exciting to be finally launching it into the world. I'm going to say a few words about the background to the project, what, why it was that we thought we needed to develop an RTP framework for action and then what we have sought to achieve with the framework, and then finally just a few words on the process. So first to the question of why we thought we needed an R2P framework for action. The starting point, I mean, everyone listening into this session is aware of the global context, but I think it does nevertheless need stating as ultimately the driver behind the project is that despite the commitment to the R2P having been reiterated in scores of UN resolutions since 2005, atrocity crimes continue to be committed around the world at a horrifying scale. <clears throat> and while certainly there have been efforts to respond to these crimes, they have been patently inadequate. Collective efforts have failed to bring an end to atrocity crimes and efforts at prevention collectively have also failed. And on top of that, as we note in the introduction to the framework, many of the risk factors for atrocity crimes are trending in the wrong direction. Steadfast rules of international law are being flouted. Civilians are being increasingly targeted in political violence. Armed groups are proliferating. Far-right politics have been embraced in many countries and hate speech and identity-based violence have also increased in many parts of the world. And all of these things make it more likely that atrocity crimes will occur. But on the positive side, as I think Savita mentioned and the ambassador also mentioned, we do firmly believe that there is reason for hope for the RTP principle. The General Assembly debates on RTP attest to the fact that many states are looking for ways to shift the discussion and the debate about RTP from a discussion about the principle's normative status and dimensions to a more concrete discussion about implementation. Mm -hmm. 
in other words, what states can actually do to protect populations from atrocity crimes domestically and in their foreign policy. <laughs> And we saw this sentiment reflected quite strongly in the statements made by several states in the General Assembly's recent debate on RTP. However, in our view, efforts to advance implementation of the RTP have been challenged by the fact that there has been no actionable framework setting out what the RTP actually requires states to actually do. The RTP, as endorsed by states, as we all know, is defined in just two paragraphs of the General Assembly's World Summit Outcome Resolution of 2005. Outside that resolution, the most substantive and authoritative elaboration of what the RTP requires of states is the Secretary General's 2009 report on implementing the responsibility to protect. That report, as we know, set out an implementation strategy comprising three pillars and it proposed a series of policy ideas that the Secretary General said that states either could or should consider under each pillar. Since 2009, the Secretary General has issued annual reports on RTP. As with the 2009 report, many of the recommendations in those reports are more in the nature of policy ideas than actionable recommendations. And because of the thematic nature of the reports, the priorities proposed differ from one to the next. And most problematically, there's no document that brings all of those ideas and recommendations together in one place. So while the reports certainly help us to understand what RTP is, at least for those who have the time to read them all, they do not serve collectively as an easy to use tool outlining what states should do to honour their commitment to the RTP. So that's the gap that we have tried to address with this framework. I think it's important to say that although there has been no actionable framework for the implementation of the RTP, there is a well-developed literature on atrocity prevention, including, of course, the Secretary General's annual reports, but also the resources of states and civil society and academia. So this framework doesn't develop new ideas, but rather seeks to consolidate the best of our knowledge on what states can do to protect populations from atrocity crimes and to make that accessible to policymakers and practitioners. So in short, what we've sought to provide is an accessible guide for states regarding what it means to implement the responsibility to protect, both in relation to their own populations and populations elsewhere. The idea, as has been said, is that it is for all states, not just states that have a history of atrocity crimes or that consider themselves to be at a high risk of atrocity crimes. And for the most part, we've sought to describe what all states should do to the best of their capacity. We have tried to avoid including recommendations that are overly ambitious or that may be unrealistic for some states. That said, though, it was difficult to find the perfect balance between recommendations that we thought would be welcomed by as many states as possible and what in an ideal world we would like to see all states doing. So I think at the end of the day, what the framework describes is probably somewhere between absolute minimum core obligations and, and best practice in atrocity prevention. Finally, just a few words on the process. Um, some of you would be aware last year we um, provided a, an initial presentation of the, the idea of the framework at the annual meeting of the RTP focal points in, in DC. We have held a, a small number of consultations, including a consultation with Indonesian government officials focusing on the domestic section and consultation with ASEAN stakeholders on the regional section and then a consultation specifically with representatives of the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission for Human Rights, also on the regional section. We convened a group of expert reviewers, including former UN RTP special advisors, academics, civil society, atrocity prevention experts, and a number of others, and shared a draft with that group and received some really um, insightful and excellent feedback. We held a consultation and received feedback from some members of the RTP group of friends and RTP focal points. And finally, we received feedback from a range of Australian government departments, and we're grateful to DFAT for facilitating that process. 
So I'll leave it there and hand over to Jackie to, I think, speak um, through some of the content of the framework in a bit more detail. Thank you, Rebecca, and Jackie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Savita. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, you know, as has already been referenced in developing the framework, we sought to help demystify what R2P means in practice. Um, despite R2P emphasizing the primary responsibility of the state, often when we talk to governments, the only conception they have of implementation is about R2P being a UN commitment and about UN Security Council action. Um, and, you know, as um, Ambassador Webster referenced, this is very much about, you know, state sovereignty and what states can do for themselves, what they can do to help others. Um, so the framework is very much intended as a tool for states about state action uh, to unpack how to do atrocity prevention. Um, in this regard, the framework provides recommendations across four main spheres of action, starting first with domestic laws, policies, and institutions, then addressing how states in their bilateral interactions can work with other states um, to cooperate and help influence action or build capacity of others. Followed by that, we talk about regional cooperation and end with multilateral cooperation. Um, and while the list of actions in the framework is not exhaustive of every possible step every state could take at all times, uh, we attempted to be as inclusive as possible regarding what states should do and what we believe a majority of states should be capable of doing or assisting others in doing. Now, as part of our efforts to demystify what it means to prevent atrocities and implement R2P, you'll see that the framework is very much grounded in existing tools and mechanisms available to states domestically, in regional forums, and in multilateral settings. Neither the framework nor R2P itself have ever been about reinventing the wheel. Uh, rather, it's about using existing tools in a targeted manner to address risks associated with identity-based grievances, human rights violations, and other contributors to atrocities. Mm -hmm. um, this means that the recommendations include best practices for aims like achieving good governance, upholding rule of law, protection of minorities, prevention of conflict, and so forth, which all holistically contribute to atrocity prevention. Um, now, as we developed the framework, we also referenced other resources on atrocity prevention, including the UN Framework of Analysis for Atrocity Crimes, which clearly lays out risk factors for atrocities. In doing this, we created a sort of synergy between understanding the risk of atrocities and the, the why for taking particular actions with a comprehension and list of recommendations for how to confront those risks via state policies and practices. Uh, we encourage all states to utilize this framework to assess gaps and identify opportunities to address atrocity risks in your own country, as well as to understand options available for responding to risks in your region and around the world. Um, so with that in mind, I'll quickly walk through the contents of the framework. Um, the, the document is divided into four main sections. Um, section one is preventing and responding at the national level. Section two is preventing and responding through bilateral cooperation and influencing. Section three is preventing and responding through regional cooperation. And finally, preventing and responding through multilateral cooperation. Under each of these sections, there are a series of categories of actions that states can take in this regard, such as, um, you know, under the national level, we have things like promote social and economic equality and combat exclusion and discrimination, establish and support independent human rights institutions, promote access to justice. Under each of these actions, we then include a list of recommended policies and practices states can implement in order to achieve the stated aim. Because we wanted this as a guide for states, the sections on regional and multilateral cooperation are centered not on what organizations can do, but on what states can do within these venues respectively. Uh, we have a tendency to speak about the UN and regional organizations as monoliths, but their actions are driven by the decisions of states. Um, while the UN Secretariat can learn a lot from reading this framework and implementing some of its recommendations, 
um, and utilizing it as a tool to even think about how to assist states in atrocity prevention. We really wanted this to be a guide for states to think about what actions for atrocity prevention are available to them within venues like the Human Rights Council or even the Peace Building Commission or similar bodies. Um, and before I close and we can hand the floor to the special advisors, I wanna raise one more note on how we compose the framework. Due to the nature of atrocity crimes, we have emphasized within the document that the actions should be implemented through an intersectional lens that accounts for the diversity of individuals within their population across their personal characteristics from religion to ethnicity, nationality, race, color, descent, age, gender, sexual orientation, or other characteristics, um, as each of these factors may contribute to unique vulnerabilities to atrocity crimes for populations. So while we did not have the space to emphasize each characteristic across each and every recommendation on every page, um, our hope is that all of the recommendations will be implemented in this spirit and with the sort of knowledge that um, policies need to be targeted in a way that addresses the unique vulnerabilities of each and every aspect of a country's population. Um, so with that, uh, I'll note that the framework will be available on both of our center's websites um, by the end of the event and uh, will also be distributed on our social media and mailing lists. Um, and we hope that it is a useful tool um, for everyone here today and for states. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca, Jackie, for that very comprehensive sort of uh, uh, view of the, the framework itself. And again, I would like to express my uh, gratitude and, and thank you to all the experts um, who have contributed to making this uh, uh, framework uh, useful and, and, you know, uh, uh, and timely in how we are approaching RTP. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, special advisors on RTP. Um, uh, you know, we have George Okot Obo, the, the current special advisor on the responsibility to protect. We have Karen Smith, who is the former special uh, uh, advisor on the on RTP. And of course, um, yeah, His Excellency uh, Mr. Ivan Simonovich, who is a permanent representative of the uh, mission to Croatia, but also uh, was the former special advisor on R2P. And uh, it is such a pleasure to have uh, uh, you all with us. It's my honor to know each one of you. And I would just like to say that these are also some of the nicest uh, uh, people uh, I know in the policy world. Uh, so. Uh, we have two sets of questions that can sort of shed more light on the usefulness of this uh, framework. And my first question is uh, to, um, to uh, all three of you. So there are two questions we'll ask uh, all three of you to come in on that. And the order for the first question will be, Karen, from you, we will go to George and then to uh, Ivan. And so the first question is that we, know, we have witnessed uh, very starkly where uh, the international community has failed in its implementation of RTP. Like we have many, many examples of these failures. So, but from your experience as the special advisors, what successes or best practices have you witnessed in the implementation? How would you sort of think about um, this, the, 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 some of the successes and, and, and best practices that that have come out over the, the last few years and during your experience as a special advisor. So Karen, I would go to you first. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Savita. And I just want to start off firstly by congratulating Rebecca and, and Jackie for a, a tremendous product. And we'll get to that, uh, I think, with the second question. But I, I really think we shouldn't underestimate what a, what a tremendous resource this, this is for, for states, but also pretty everybody working in the field of R2P. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I know that some of my colleagues have much more to say than I have, so I will try to keep it short. Um, but I think if I think in terms of uh, successes, and you're absolutely right, there's there's so much focus um, on you know th the negatives, the 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 failures, and I think that's that's partly human nature. It's, this is not specific to RTP. Um, but I if I think about R2P, and this is not necessarily, you know, during my mandate, but, but there are a few specific country cases that stand out where the risk of atrocity crimes was very high and the timely action of the international community prevented their commission. And, and of course, here I'm thinking 
specifically of the electoral violence in Kenya in 2007, 2008, and the more recent crisis in the Gambia. Um, and so perhaps my colleagues you know, want, to, want to say a little bit more about that, but without going into in, any, um, into any detail, for me, I think the important point to make about both of these cases in terms of best practice is the collaboration between sub-regional and regional organizations, the UN and other international actors. And so I think, you know, looking at these cases closely really um, shows us, they really serve as examples of how prevention, but also response can work when different actors really work together and they kind of have a united purpose. Um, I think overall, the successes have not really been of the newsworthy headline making type, you know, so it hasn't been Security Council authorizations of the use of force to stop atrocity crimes. Um, but there have been advances that have been perhaps less, less visible um, and incremental. And here again, you know, I think of things like the inclusion of protection of civilian mandates in peacekeeping operations. And this is something which has been happening quietly within the Security Council and is not really something which has you know, made, made headline news. And yet this is a really important part of, of really kind of implementing R2P in the day-to-day -day work of the UN. Um, I also want to mention the quiet, consistent work being done by civil society organizations uh, like your own, but also others on the ground in building resilience against the trusty crimes on the ground through capacity building, through monitoring, through early warning, et cetera. Um, and I really think we need to always emphasize that and, and states really need to also recognize how important these actors are in doing this work and, and therefore you know, continue, continuing to support them. Um, perhaps the most visible successes on the side of states have been on the legal side of things. And I'm thinking here of the special mechanisms created by the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council, for example, um, but also in terms of advances in international criminal justice, like the principle of, of universal uh, jurisdiction. Now, having said that, and while these are, of course, all very important and accountability measures should not be underestimated as a preventive and a deterrent tool, I also think that the emphasis on dealing with what happens after the fact should be of concern. Um, I'm based in the Netherlands, and I've clearly witnessed the shift uh, in emphasis over the last six years that I've been here. Um, and so I also want to make the point that, uh, you know, while this has been a success, I think states cannot focus exclusively on dealing with across atrocity crimes once they've occurred. Uh, there really needs to be more of a concerted effort to prevent and also to respond to them. And I think this is where the report serves as a, as a very useful prompt. And I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. No, thank you, Karen, for raising those really, really important points. I think that the role of civil society and um, the proliferation of monitoring mechanisms is something that you know we have seen over the last decade, which have been very useful in collecting evidence of the commission of atrocity crimes and sort of very bringing them to light in the context that these are just not human rights violations, but sort of a systematic attack on a particular population. And the other bit, I truly agree with you that there's a lot of focus on accountability and, and you know when there's not a lot of options, that's what we're focusing on. But I think the focus has to be on prevention and response. Um, and accountability is part of it, but accountability cannot be the only thing that we consistently um, uh, implement rather than just uh, response and, uh, and prevention. And uh, George, I would now go to you, please, the floor is. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Savita. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. And uh, I want to join uh, Karen in really congratulating the two centers for having uh, brought uh, this product uh, to life uh, today. In the next segment, I will uh, uh, elaborate my delight uh, uh, for, 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 for why that is uh, for a project that I have supported from the inception. The other thing is that Karen has made my work very easy because quite frankly, I would say I endorse everything that she has said. They were all on my talking points and leave it there. But just allow me to add one or two things in terms of the success of R2P. Number one, I think R2P is inescapable today. And not even by those who contend it and some on legitimate grounds, but others on political and ideological grounds. So the difference between 17 um, uh, years ago and uh, uh, today is a discourse which inevitably interrogates gratuitous mass murder 
as even more unacceptable than it was um, in, for example, 1994. Now, whether that is coupled with the uh, actions that prevent it is a slightly different issue, but I would really say that today, R2P is inescapable and for the good. And number two, if there was any question about that, the people themselves, the populations themselves, whether they might use R2P language or not, but they have used R2P language, call for it. And there is this consciousness that R2P is an accountability which today as compared with 17, 18 years ago, informs national responsibility. It forms bilateral relations. It is an ingrained part of global responsibility and that is different. Number three, we have to lift the veil on the one example that remains complex, which is Libya. Let me say that the downstream parts of what happened in Libya, that it was captured for other purposes, that um, um, as Karen said, what happens after maybe was not attended to, all that I think all of us in this discussion would agree. But the question is this, of all of us who are in this meeting today, if we faced a situation where a state or other actors were on the verge of intentionally eliminating large parts of our brothers and sisters on this world and you were in the Security Council, what would you say to the Security Council as the most imperative action that needs to be taken at that time, even if it might not involve uh, measures of war? What is the language that you would voice at that time? What is the imperative that you would frame? Now, if that is the case, does that explain, doesn't that explain why in the case of Libya, at the beginning of that decision, there was almost uniform support for it, for that action? Number four is, I will just simply echo what Karen has said, that let us look at other examples that travel side by side with that very, very problematic uh, example. Shouldn't we ask the people of Cote d'Ivoire, the people of Kenya, the people of Gambia that has been mentioned? And today, if we look at uh, mechanisms and other mandates which have in them crowned directly or indirectly R2P type outcomes, whether those are peacekeeping missions, whether that is international criminal law enforcement via the Security Council, etc. Who would not be delighted that today accountability against mass murder mm, is gaining more and more crystallity and more and more uh, um, um, uh, recognition. I would like to conclude with two things. The first one is really operationalization. The more we see in the mandate of a continental organization, such as in the region in which I come from, that R2P type commitments are established normatively, normatively as one of the pillars of that whole region. When we see more and more countries, and we'll say more about that in the next segment, crystallizing in their foreign policies as a mandated, a mandated parameter of their external relations, R2P outcomes, isn't this what we should not we should 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 be happy about? Shouldn't we urge all others to do exactly the same. And if there would be opposition to that, I would be interested to hear, maybe there is a legitimate reason for it. I would be in interested to hear why not so that we work around that. And finally, knowledge, advocacy, and the community of R2 peers. Eh? This, I think if we looked as compared with 17 years ago is a big difference, including the current uh, membership. I would only say, 
that this should grow. I was not a member of this community, at least explicitly until 17 months ago. I became a member of that community. Some of you um, may have heard that my personal circumstances may change slightly, but I would confirm that if there is anything that these 17 months have done to me, is that once you become an R2 peer, you can never become, you can never unbecome an R2 peer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, George. And uh, no, it's been such a privilege to, to work with you within this community. And also, I think that I really appreciate uh, you talking about, um, uh, you know, that how we have won the battle of ideas in, in a way that, you know, there's no state really that can stand and, uh, you know, within the General Assembly or at the Human Rights Council and say that it has start blanche to, to commit these atrocities. And also, I really like the fact that you distinguish between state and its people, uh, because what we have seen from civil society around the world, from affected populations around the world, is that they want, um, uh, you know, their uh, the perpetrators held responsible. And, and that's a very, very important point, which has to be communicated to the UN system and across member states that do not to conflate governments with, with their populations, because populations do want to be protected. Um, so thank you very much for that. And last but not the least, uh, Mr. Simonovich, please, the floor is yours. You're muted, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Savita. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, let me uh, join uh, congratulations to all those who contributed to the creation of the framework uh, for action. And of course, first of all, uh, Rebecca and Jackie. Such a catalog of measures that states should take to mitigate atrocity crimes risk was very much needed. And now that we have it, it is crucial to put it to the best possible use. I would also like uh, uh, to use this opportunity to express uh, my regrets because of George's uh, resignation and thank him very much uh, for all that he has contributed to R2P and that he wants to remain uh, after the end of his mandate a part of uh, to the community. Uh, uh, I think that we also uh, should uh, collectively reflect why the life expectancy of R2P mandate holders is so short. Uh, Karin is here, uh, myself, George, but Jennifer, uh, no more than two years, uh, and it's getting shorter and shorter. So I think uh, that 20th anniversary of R2P in 2025 deserves a proper review of uh, development of R2P from concept towards its implementation, but also the way it is positioned and institutionalized uh, within uh, the United Nations system. But back to your uh, question, uh, Savita, of course, uh, uh, we had uh, some successes in atrocity crimes prevention. Uh, Karen mentioned two good examples of Kenya and Gambia. Uh, I would uh, uh, mention that in addition uh, to shiny successes, uh, there were some less shiny, keeping some countries on the brink and uh, supporting them not to fall into abyss, such as, uh, for example, uh, Burundi. Uh, however, uh, it is quite clear that uh, the uh, success stories were too few, and it's rather difficult uh, to assess whether we can attribute these successes particularly to responsibility to protect. Therefore, I would like to point out the importance of the framework uh, for action in the overall historical progress of R2P and its transformation uh, from concept uh, into a tool for action. Uh, we had a couple of milestones in this process. Let me uh, briefly turn to the multilateral. 
And of course, the starting point was the report of the International Commission uh, on uh, Intervention and State Sovereignty that developed the concept uh, in 2001. Uh, the World Outcome Document in 2005, uh, followed by uh, GA and Security Council twin resolution, uh, unanimously adopted, uh, endorsed the responsibility to protect. Uh, as uh, has been mentioned, the general resolution uh, in two, from 2009 uh, articulated R2P through three pillars, facilitating uh, its implementation. And then we have the GA resolution from 2021 placing uh, R2P permanently on the GA agenda and uh, 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 formalizing a secretary general's report. However, we still did not put uh, the AG's mandated reports and uh, general assembly the base to the best possible use. I fully agree with Ambassador Webster that we need uh, to transform both of them into something much more concrete action and implementation oriented. But in addition to multilateral milestone, we also had uh, milestones in development of R2P tools and two major ones. The first was the development of framework uh, of analysis in 2014, uh, the comprehensive catalog of indicators of uh, atrocity crimes, uh, risks, uh, something that Jackie uh, described very well as why. Uh, however, the second milestone is this catalog of measures that states should consider to mitigate atrocity crimes contained in the framework for action uh, that we are launching right here now it is obviously a big moment for R2P. Its evolution that I described clearly demonstrates uh, evolution from concept to its implementation. The added value of framework for action is that states now exactly know what they should do to mitigate atrocity crimes risks. If they do not implement uh, the suitable evidence-based measures, they can and should be held accountable for their negligence or even worse, for their bad intentions. So let us continue discussing how to roll out uh, uh, the R2P framework for action and how to put it to a best possible use. Thank you, Savita, back to you. No, thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador. That's, that's really uh, interesting. And I would really like to sort of highlight the point you made that you know, not all successes are very loud. And we also have to think in terms of um, countries where uh, things did not go from bad to worse. I mean, they were not, you know, Burundi is not a success, but it's it would have been, uh, it would have been uh, really, really bad. And sort of your points on where we have come in the multilateral arena are really important for to sort of think about a norm which is so young, you know, I mean, now we are going to be, it's going to be the 20th anniversary of the responsibility to protect and we're still struggling so much. I mean, this year we are, uh, you know, marking the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And there's so much work that still needs to be done. So thinking in terms of sort of continuum of, of space and time and, you know, and where we are, it's important to sort of keep that into perspective that this is a young norm, but it has tried to uh, achieve uh, a lot. So my now second question is uh, very much about the framework itself. And, um, uh, you know, at the risk of sounding too self-congratulatory, I, I think that you know, this is a really important work in terms of advancing how we understand and demystify uh, our RPP. So again, George, I will begin with you. And if you could just, you know, talk a little bit about how this framework could be useful for states as well as the UN. I mean, Jackie very you know, clearly articulated that this can also assist the UN in understanding what states need, what kind of capacity building is needed to actually uh, move forward this norm of RPP. Thank you. Jackie. Thank you, Ambassador. Can you hear me? 
Okay, so thank you again. Um, I want to again echo my disclosure that I have supported this project from the very inception. I still do and will um, even after um, uh, August the 7th. The question is why? Why do I support this project? And what does it represent for us today? Uh, you will hear me echo what has already been said and maybe add one or two points and I'll try to do all of it as quickly as possible. The first one is that since I started in this work, I was exercised so strongly by the need as um, Jackie and Rebecca and Ambassador Webster said, to not only demystify R2P, but to unpack it, to unpack it in terms of what does it mean? So this is the first reason why I support this project. Because what it has done now, it is saying to all of us players, but particularly to states, including those which are really friendly to their responsibility, that this is what it could look like for you, depending on your particular demographics, your particular cohort, and let us work around it concretely like this to make it uh, happen. So I support this very much. And as you will hear, I think it has an implication for us in terms of follow-up. The one thing that I would urge the global level to copy from this framework is to tilt a little bit this discourse about contestation. I do not deny at all that there should be things which should be um, argued about, which should be clarified more, but let us now come down to this level which says it could look like this, this is what I do not agree with, this is not what I do like, rather than arguing at only an ideological level. I think that is energy and power which could be more usefully directed elsewhere. Secondly, Ever since I came to this function, I also really yearned very much to see R2P tilt decisively towards the national theater, or because indeed that is the bulwark of R2P. It's so much attention is rightly paid and energy expended at the global level because of course R2P has accountabilities at that level as well, but it all starts down on the ground. And I am so pleased that more than half the framework is dedicated to this um, um, uh, angle of things. Again, as I've said, uh, to see how it can be constructed, how it can be articulated, how it can be uh, made to, 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 to work. Whether as a, uh, the advisor on R2P as, as, or as a free citizen of the world, this is one dimension I really want to continue my engagement to uh, uh, work on. I will return to my country of origin. I can assure all of you that when I am there, uh, what I'll be looking to is where, how this framework can land at home and continue to be made to work as the first 15 pages of the framework say um, that uh, 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 it should. I'm going to talk about two points which do not stand out too sharply in the framework, but I think which are there. The first of them really is national political will, ownership and accountability. To me, this is the floor of R2P. And it is something which it's not possible to generate out of uh, a 23 page document. It is something which must be worked on. But I think where the framework is so helpful is it says, if these things which are set out in this, in this framework happen, are made to happen, that gives life to national accountability, to national ownership, and to the delivery of the responsibility which you yourself as a government, you are um, underlining that is important to you. My fourth point appears in the report, but I particularly want to support it very strongly. And that is the regional dimension. In the three, or really the two paragraphs that Rebecca mentioned in which uh, R2P is created in the 2000 World Outcome, the regional dimension is treated almost as a poor cousin. Mm -hmm. To me, in order for R2P to be grounded, the regional dimension is fundamental. And as I've said several times, why? Because a degree of localization is inevitable, both at regional and at national level. And I think to bring the regional dimension so strongly as the framework does is the direction in which uh, we should go. And that is the other reason why I support it. For my last reason, we go back to the global level. And here I want maybe to um, echo and support very much uh, what has been said about um, uh, the, the framework. 
in that, especially when we recall this argument about at the global level, R2P being only about the sharp end and being about um, uh, um, uh, 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 war and about military solutions, I think the bandwidth which the framework sets up long before you ever get there is really, really valuable for all, including at, uh, at the global level. And that has my own support. So what I want to conclude with is what next? Where do we go from here? What does this framework represent? And number one, I would say that the work is only just starting now. I think we should in today and in continuing conversations, find a way for the framework not to end up on a shelf, not to end up in a drawer somewhere. And that most of all, particularly at national level, it takes life. I think the two pen holders so far um, should be supported if uh, to continue to be supported, to continue to be a pen holder and to continue to be um, a source of dynamic now in saying to particularly governments that look, we want to continue to work with you to see how this can be uh, made to work. I can state here very, very unequivocally the continuing support of my function, and I would say the office at large. Because as I said, this was my eminent uh, uh, objective. It continues now. And I think, and I think uh, uh, Savita and Rebecca, you know, that I am continuing to try and secure uptake for this framework as a programmed objective of the work of uh, uh, our office as, as, as it continues. Two more things and I'll shut up. For the states which are represented in this discussion, please do not wait. Please at least take this document and at least go through it. It's only 23 pages. I'm sure a version could be made out of it that is four pages of the most critical things and see how you know it can be fertilized and crystallized within any one of the dimensions that especially the first 15 pages of the report talks about, but all across the board. So I really want to lend a very, very strong voice to um, the document. And finally, linkages. The linkages, the framework of analysis has already been made. A number of players already have national, regional level frameworks and instruments. I think this uh, handshake between this framework and all the available tools and frameworks there is another one that needs to be capitalized on. And I think the actors and players who are in this discussion from that point of view, I want to add exactly the same thing for you and to continue initially for sure with the, the two organizations that have brought it here, but more and more of us should also bring our hands to bear on this ship that should move forward very decisively. I give it back to you and thank you very much, Savita. No, thank you, George, and thank you so much for sort of highlighting the uh, the need for us to really delve into uh, the localization element, the the regional element, and and yeah, we are very happy that this framework devotes a, a huge amount of space and and time uh, on unpacking what it means at the national level because that is also a way that you know contestation and and that's such, a, such an important point that you raise. The contestation happens at this conceptual level of sovereignty and you know shifting that contestation to this framework would be an interesting change of pace and conversation because I would really like to see that who contests the fact that you know people should have uh, access to justice or minorities should be protected so thank you very much for that and thank you for um you know taking this back to Uganda and and and, and working on this uh, with us um uh, Ivan uh, I would like to go to you next uh, Uh, thank you, Savita. Uh, so many things to raise, uh, but uh, let's uh, let let me share with you a short anecdote. <clears throat> when I was uh, teaching the atrocity crimes prevention course at the Penn Law School, I was requesting my students to involved in the assessment of risks uh, in the selected country. Uh, based on the framework of analysis. But in addition, I requested them to propose a set of mitigating measures to reduce those risks. If only my students had the framework uh, for action in front of them, their task would have been much easier 
and I would have been certainly much happier with their response. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, the 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 main uh, the main uh, <clears throat> the main uh, application of uh, the framework is not for my students to have less work and to have better grades. Uh, it, it's, it's, its real uh, uh, purpose is uh, to change uh, the implementation of R2P and reduce atrocity crimes uh, risks in practice. But for this to happen, it uh, has to be uh, widely known and widely used by people who are practically involved in atrocity crimes prevention. And uh, uh, just as this tool is very practical, I would like to be practical as well. Uh, I think that group of friends of R2P in Geneva and New York, as well as focal point network are logical starting points in rollout uh, of uh, this framework. Uh, we need to introduce framework for action and to all those three groups. Uh, but uh, in addition uh, to, to launches like this one, perhaps we can organize workshops for all interested member states during which uh, mitigating measures based on framework for action uh, would be proposed to mitigate atrocity crimes risk in volunteering countries. Perhaps these workshops could include both risk assessment and examining suitable mitigating measures, but we must go further. We need to bring the framework for action to the attention of the Security Council, ECOSOC, Human Rights Council and Peacebuilding Commission. Uh, it is not going to be easy, but it's worth trying. For example, the annual ECOSOC debate on the influence on economic and social factors on atrocity crimes prevention that we started this year, but decided that it should be an annual event, could next year be related to the economic and social measures included in the framework for action. Uh, as uh, the PBC chair for this year, perhaps I can help to affirm uh, the framework as a sustainable peace building tool. Uh, colleagues, there will be a lot of opportunities in the near future. We will be discussing the new agenda for peace as well as uh, summit of the future. In 2025, uh, there is a peace building review as well as R2P's 20th anniversary. Let us use uh, the, these, all these mentioned uh, events uh, and discussion leading to them to promote R2P as well as the framework for action. Finally, uh, let me conclude the framework for action has a great potential. It is not just a tool, it's another milestone and uh, the great opportunity in moving from conceptual debate to its implementation uh, of responsibility uh, uh, to protect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador uh, uh, Zivanovic, for those very kind words. And also, you know, as usual, um, you know, every time I have any conversations with you, you always have these many different plans already in motion or already in place in terms of how we can move these discussions forward. So it's always such a privilege to, to hear from you and, and all these ideas are fantastic, I'm sure. Um, my team and the team at Asia Pacific Center is noting all of these brilliant ideas down and, and we will definitely follow up with you um, uh, on all of these. Um, and Karen, uh, now the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Savita. Um, I'm hope, I hope I'm not going to, uh, you know, overlap too much with what's already been said, but but I, I just really, yeah, I, I really can't, can't, can't say, you know, str more strongly how important I think this document is. Um, and, and the other, uh, my other two colleagues have already emphasized this. Um, I think we all know that political will remains the biggest obstacle to the implementation of R2P. I think that's that's not you know that's uh, not disputed. But when there is even a small amount of will, 
uh, I think a clear roadmap of what the available options for implementation are makes all the difference. And that's essentially what this, what this report is. Um, I also think we should not assume that implementation is common sense. Um, and uh, you know, without offending anyone, I'm not sure that many diplomats or policymakers, if put on the spot, would be able to provide a coherent answer to what in practice it means for a state to protect its population from atrocity crimes, for example. Um, and so as Rebecca noted, I think while the three pillars provide broad guidelines um, that have to some extent been filled in since 2009 by successive SG reports on R2P, this document really essentially collates all of this information and adds a lot more detail. Um, and I just wanna say again that Rebecca and Jackie have done you know, a tremendous amount of work in drawing on a, a really wide range of existing documents and, and, and scholarship. And in practice, this saves state actors, but all of us tasked with R2P, uh, a lot of time. And it really provides a kind of cheat sheet of sorts, um, the value of which should, again, not be underestimated, especially in a world where the challenge is not access to information, but finding the time to make one's way through what is sometimes an overwhelming amount of information. Um, and so in terms of, you know, who this is, who this is really useful to, I think it's useful to a lot of people, but it's going to be of particular importance to individual champions of R2P in governments. They now essentially have a to-do list that makes R2P much more concrete. Uh, I think, for example, of national focal points who can use this to approach their counterparts in other parts of government. Um, if I look at the document, you know, Action 1.8 provides an opening to engaging with officials in the education sector. Um, Actions 1.5 and 1.11 speak directly to the mandate of the Justice Department. Um, and in response to the, the recurrent critique that R2P is vague and abstract, as, you know, George also mentioned, the report really is very practical in providing step-by-step -step guidelines for implementation. Um, and as Ivan has noted, I see this as a sister document to the UN framework of analysis and other similar risk assessment frameworks, going beyond the identification of risks to the even more important question of what to do once these risks are identified. And this has been a gaping hole in the implementation of R2P. So I can only second what Ivan has said, that this really is a milestone in terms of, of uh, the development of R2P. Um, and finally, I think like the 2021 report that was also written by Rebecca on the powers of the General Assembly in preventing and responding to atrocity crimes, which, by the way, should be on every UN diplomat's desk and not as George cautioned in a drawer. Um, this document also serves as a reminder that so much can and should be done both inside and outside of the UN system long before an issue gets to the dreaded Security Council. Um, and I can only hope that states will recognize its value and actually use it. Thank you so much. No, thank you, Karen. And that's such an important point about saying that it's, it, it boils down to political will, but sometimes I think there's a lack of sort of a roadmap or what to do. And I think that, you know, within the international sphere on protecting populations, upholding human rights or promoting democracy, now we have more and more information on what to do. And now it's up to states to sort of take that mantle up and, and do it. Um, thank you all for joining us and thank you, uh, a very big thank you to all of our three special advisors who have supported this initiative from its inceptions, from the very early conversations that we had with them. Uh, your graciousness, your support, um, and your sort of intellectual powers, which has went into creating this document cannot be uh, 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 diminished in, in any way. So thank you so much. And I would again like to thank this, um, I'd like to take this time to thank George for all his work in the last 17 months. Um, I would not be remiss in saying that the entire RTP community is extremely um, sad that your tenure is coming to an end. Um, you know, each special advisor brings a, a unique take on how to uh, move things forward. And you coming from the continent of Africa and, and making it very much about uh, sort of, you know, uh, your experiences and your experiences with different conversations you've had with real people on the ground for whom protection is a, a, is a, is a daily need is something which has been very, very important. So thank you for all the work you have done. And um, thank you, Ivan and Karen. You know, you were also great warriors 
uh, in this. And Ivan, I would really like to sort of, um, you know, take this platform to say that as the RTP community, we have to sort of question um, the, the premise that why is it that, you know, special advisors, um, you know, sometimes uh, are, are unable to, you know, function in a way that they would have liked to, and that leads to sort of, you know, shorter uh, uh, tenures uh, in, in this position. So thank you again for everything. And before I go, I would definitely like to thank the, the staff at both our centers. Uh, I'm now speaking on behalf of myself, as well as um, Dr. Alex Bellamy from the Asia Pacific Center for RTP. Um, you know, uh, Jackie and Rebecca led the research and, and, and very much uh, were the, the primary sort of uh, writers and, and researchers on this. But, you know, every a document of this size and the document of, of this ambition is not possible without the, the teamwork that the entire staff of both centers have uh, provided both administratively as well as through their research and, and through their thought processes. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank the, the entire teams at Asia Pacific Center and the Global Center for, for making uh, this, uh, um, this event and this, this framework uh, possible. So have a fantastic day and thank you everybody and let's keep on keeping on. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, Bye. Excellent moderation, Savita. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ambassador. <laughs> Bye.